everyone's having a really good time. I welcome everyone to our Thanksgiving dinner and happy Thanksgiving. Um, it's such a nice group of people. Thanks for coming at such short notice and thank you Gerhard Manns also for helping to curate this really lovely group of people. Um, <laughs> well, whoever came in, I said, you can sit anywhere. Everyone's nice and interesting tonight. Yes. Isn't that wonderful? Um, yeah, I just wanted to welcome you. Well, initially, I just wanted to welcome you briefly and then hand over to our speaker, Dr. David McEwen, who will talk about the results of the midterm elections. But you know, November is also about like um, a bit of nostalgia and you remember things and then I found an <laughs> I found an old speech that I used to hold with my former boss 15 years ago in Stuttgart for Thanksgiving and this went on for um, 15 pages um, <laughs> in, in uh, German and English and uh, my former boss was known not for not holding introductions but doing something that the Germans call Kurreferate. Um, but we did these um, speeches for our Thanksgiving dinner that in Stuttgart we organized um, at the army barracks at Patch Barracks in Stuttgart at the so-called um, Swabian Special Events Center. <laughs> so it was, it had a crackling fireplace, it was really, it smelled American up there. Um, and there was a bar where you could order whiskey sours afterwards. So I'm not going to make you jealous because you're in Freiburg and Freiburg is so much better than Stuttgart anyways. But, um, so I just, he usually took the audience through the whole history of Thanksgiving and then included three lame jokes about Thanksgiving as well. And I just want to give you a, like a, a short extract from that speech because it has, it has some highlights and I hope I picked the right ones. Um, I don't know, you'll be the judge of that. But I'm sure you all know about the history of the Mayflower and her crew, every kid learning English in school today cannot help but learn about the story of the Mayflower and the Pilgrim Fathers. And so you'll also know that in the fall of 1621, and the exact date is actually unknown, around 50 pilgrims and about 90 Native Americans from the Wampanoag tribe came together to celebrate a three day long feast that only later would be called Thanksgiving. And today in the 21st century, there are about 10 million Americans traveling through the air over Thanksgiving a weekend. And another 40 million Americans are on the road to meet friends and family to celebrate Thanksgiving together. In this, in this Thanksgiving traveling context, I'd like to tell you the following joke. Here we go. <laughs> A man in Phoenix calls his son in New York the day before Thanksgiving and says, I hate to ruin your day, but I have to tell you that your mother and I are divorcing. 45 years of misery are just enough. <laughs> Pop, what are you talking about? The son screams. We can't stand the sight of each other any longer, the father says. We're sick of each other. And I'm sick of talking about this so you can call your sister in Chicago and tell her yourself. Frantic, the son calls his sister who explodes on the phone. Like heck, they're getting divorced, she shouts. I'll take care of this. She calls Phoenix immediately and screams at her father, you are not getting divorced. Don't do a single thing until I get there. I'm calling my brother back and we'll both be there tomorrow. Until then, don't do a thing. Do you hear me? And hangs up. The old man hangs up his phone and turns to his wife. Okay, he says, they're coming for Thanksgiving and they're paying their own way. <laughs> okay. um, still works, 50, oh God. <laughs> um, so regardless of how it came to us, Thanksgiving is now a quintessential American day devoid of a religious affiliation and ethnicity. People of all races and religions celebrate in a truly independent way with one purpose in mind, to focus on the nation's blessing. And um, 
but I think you can, there's always a um, Thanksgiving proclamation and you can read the president's proclamation as well. And because of the climate, you can see that he's actually putting some kind of uh, religious references in there that maybe were not there 15 years before. It's actually an interesting topic. Um, yeah, if you look at recent American fiction, there's not that much mentioning of um, Thanksgiving. But there's Richard Ford's novel, The Lay of the Land, and the narration starts just two days before Thanksgiving and ends about 500 pages later on Thanksgiving Day. And uh, the reader doesn't really learn that much about the holiday itself, but I want to quote that as well from Richard Ford. I've said nothing so far about my own Thanksgiving plans, now just two days away and counting, and that involved my two children. My reticence in this matter may owe to the fact that I've organized events to be purposefully unspectacular and to accommodate as much as possible everyone's personal agendas, biological clocks, comfort zones, and need for wiggle room, while offering a pleasant, neutral setting for non-confrontational fami familial good cheer. My thought is that by my plans being unambitious, the holiday won't deteriorate into apprehension, dismay, and rage, <laughs> rocketing people out the doors and back to the turnpike long before sundown. <laughs> Takes place in New Jersey. Um, <laughs> um, Thanksgiving ought to be the versatile, easy to like holiday, suitable to the secular and religious, adaptable to weddings, christenings, funerals, first date anniversaries, <coughs> early season ski trips, and new romantic interludes. It often just doesn't work out that way. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was Richard Ford. I'll spare you two other jokes. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but um, in the 1920s, Thanksgiving parades were put together in big cities. That's when uh, those started. The most famous parade was established in 1924 by the department store, and you might know that Macy's in New York City. And um, I don't know if we can say until today, are they still doing the parades? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, Santa Claus appears for the first time and he will remain the most important personality until Christmas. And uh, 10 years later, in 1934, another tradition was started by the National Football League. In that year, the Detroit Lions played against the Chicago Bears. And ever since the Lions play against another team on Thanksgiving Day. This means that in many families, the men sit in front of the TV set to watch the game while the women are busy in the kitchen. <laughs> it's 15 year old this <laughs> Um, and in December 1941, Congress passed a joint resolution establishing Thanksgiving as a federal holiday to be held annually on the fourth Thursday of November every year. Um, there's much more. I can send you the speech about all the things and the pardoning of the turkeys. I have not checked what the names were of, of the pardoned turkeys this year, but um, I hope you enjoyed this little... Uh, kind of trip into down memory lane that I took and I thought I found some kind of uh, uh, fun aspects on Thanksgiving um, and I think they brought the real American um, atmosphere of Thanksgiving uh, to us here in Freiburg as well um, and now before the turkey and while the salad is served I'd like to welcome Dr. David McCune um, he's been our guest before here in Freiburg. He um, is uh, from Sonoma State University. He joined the faculty in fall of 2003, and his expertise rests in two broad areas, American politics and international relations, and he received his doctorate from University of California, Riverside, in 2002. He does research in two areas, state and local elections, and the study of terrorism as well. He's been teaching courses on international national politics, security, state and local politics, campaigns and elections and political behavior. <coughs> so he's the perfect speaker um, to talk about um, the midterms. And Dr. McEwen was also a Fulbright teacher, I think in the Czech Republic, right? And um, <coughs> he's been, he was on, um, Anja Schuler's podcast, the Heidelberg Center <laughs> of American Studies podcast just recently. And he's been a speaker at the Kai Schwartz House when 
Eberhard Fugmann um, was in charge and uh, was a guest, the first guest that he recommended me to definitely invite again. Mm -hmm. And then uh, during the pandemic, that wasn't possible. So we're really happy that you're back here and that you brought your partner, Pam. Welcome, Pam. It's really nice to have you. So um, we're looking forward to your talk. We can maybe answer or discuss a little bit, but then during the turkey, it'll just be the turkey. And then uh, <laughs> 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 we can talk again. So welcome, David. And I, oh, your speech is called Analysis of the Unparalleled and Unrivaled 2022 Midterm Elections, A Red Wave or Blue Wall. We chose the title before the elections, and we're all kind of we are, I'm not going to say all, we're kind of relieved. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, David. Um, well, thank you all very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I want to thank you all for your hospitality and your warmth, for your support of the Carl Schuh House. Um, as board members, as members of the community, it's wonderful to see uh, my good friend and uh, warm uh, friend, uh, Eberhard Fugman, who was very hopeful when my son and I came here a few years ago. Uh, it's wonderful to have Pam here. It's wonderful to see Anya. Okay. Thank you, kids. Wonderful. All right. Thank you all very much. Okay, that's it. It's over. Uh, everything I say from here is going to be wrong, controversial, helpful, quite critical. Because American politics in the last month, the last four or five years, the last six years, has gone bonkers. Everything that we thought about American politics, the rules I'm going to present to you, have been stood on their head. Not part of that is Donald Trump, sure. Part of that is that there isn't one Freedom Caucus in Congress. There are four. Part of that is that Democrats don't know what they're doing. Part of that is the Republicans are in complete chaos. And American society is changing rapidly, as you all know. I study a particular group called the Ray, the Rising American Electorate. The Rising American Electorate are comprised of young people, about 25 to 35, 35, 45, 45, 55. They're changing American politics in fundamental ways. The last election that was traditional, old school party coalitions, was in 2016. Secretary Clinton versus Donald Trump. The 2020 election was a pivot election, kind of the first time or a change, if you will, between the old and new. And in 2024, it is the first majority minority election in the United States, in the midst of two party coalitions that are rapidly changing. And we know that there are several things going on here. We know that there are economic, social, and political changes going on in our society. And you don't have to be an NFL fan to understand that American politics has a deep cultural racial divide that is also predicated on where people buy their goods at what we call a Whole Foods or I call a Whole Paycheck or a Cracker Barrel or a Waffle House. And that this difference between, say, North and South, East and West, between us versus them, has created the single biggest output of this particular midterm the depth of polarization and that deepening polarization that has, if you will, solidified or in the literature of political science, calcified at some level. Nonetheless, the people we are interested in are what are called the purple people. These aren't Democrats or Republicans. These aren't red people or blue people. When you put those two colors together, what do you get? Purple. You know, Americans can't answer that question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Right. Purple. And the purple people are independents, right? They're socially liberal. They're economically conservative. They live outside of Orlando, Florida. They live outside of Las Vegas. They live outside of Columbus or Denver. And in political science, we call those people liars. The reason they're liars is because we ask them about God, guns, gays and lesbians, and abortion, and they exhibit partisan tendencies. And the number of people who actually elect the President of the United States is quite small. It's between 104,000 and 108,000 people. And they live in places like Pflugerville, Texas, just outside, if you will, of Austin. They live outside in these areas that are called EXURBSs, exurbs, exurban areas, emerging suburbs. And these voters are really peculiar 
They voted for George Bush's reelection in 2004, 74% of them. They voted for Barack Obama in 2008. They voted for Barack Obama in 2012. And then where'd they go in 2016? Trump. Donald Trump. 46% of college educated white women in the United States voted for Donald Trump. Rick DeSantis of Florida, this past election, got 55% of them. They voted for Bush, Obama, Obama, Trump, and in 2020, they voted for Trump. In 197 counties of the United States, Joe Biden won 15 counties. It just happened to be where people lived, all right? So America is facing this rapid change, and this particular election was very unusual, and so unusual that we have not seen these results since 1934. And what was going on in 1934? The Great Depression. So there's only been three, elect three elections in the last 125 years in the United States in which the incumbent party, the in party, has done well. 2002, first election after 9-11. 1998, Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton, 1998, and 1934. But this midterm looks a lot like 1934. Average midterm loss when the president's popularity is 42% is 36 seats. And Republicans look to have maybe 10 or 12 seats, maybe. And the key number here is that to be the Speaker of the House. There's 435 members of the, speak of the House of Representatives in Congress. So what's half that number? Oh, sorry, math, sorry. 17 and a half. 17 and a half, right. Yeah. 218. So Kevin McCarthy needs 218. Kevin McCarthy is the Republican from Bakersfield. Uh, was, uh, I, when I worked in the California legislature way back with Willie Brown, way back in the day, I worked for Republicans to start. And when I worked for the Republicans, we did opposition research or what was called dumpster diving. We did oppo on our own people. So we knew more about them than their partners or their spouses. Everybody I worked for went to federal prison for the FBI and a sting to get Willie Brown. Willie Brown hired us because we had all the dirt on the other side, all right? But Kevin McCarthy was there shortly after that time. And McCarthy was part of a group that was trying to engage Republicans to be influential in the California legislature. And as you know, California is a deeply, deeply blue state. But it also has areas that are purple and that are red. There are seven counties that are Trump counties. But counties that touch water are deeply blue. So when we look at this particular election, pay attention to counties in, in the United States that touch the water. And counties that don't touch the water have more livestock than people. And those counties are red. Those are deeply, deeply red. But this dispersion of where Democrats live. Where do Democrats live? In the cities. And where do Republicans live? In the hills, in the 17 and a half, out in those areas. And this is reflected in these results. And what we see is that there's this thing called the generic party ballot. Would you generically vote for a Democrat or a Republican? Now, Democrats have the presidency, they have the House, they have the Senate, and the out party loses on average 36 seats on average 36 seats. So which party should be advantaged on the generic ballot? The in party, that's lost all but three times in the last 125 years, or the out party? Republicans should be advantaged. And they should be advantaged by eight to 10 points by November 8th. And on November 8th, Democrats are advantaged by one point. So there's a signal to those of us that are talking heads in the media or that we do things on air and, and try to influence what's going on, that the polls were not in the right direction for Republicans. And the media, because of the changes that have gone in the United States and the things that have happened, there are a lot fewer media polls, right? Can we trust polls? Can we not trust polls? What's going on? And the polls we had were candidate polls. And the candidate polls were telling us that Republicans were facing a wave, a wave, a wave. And that wave is a trickle. Because of that 218, it looks like the Republicans will have about 220 to 222 votes in the House of Representatives. If you need 218 and you're Kevin McCarthy, and the only piece of legislation Kevin McCarthy has ever passed, his only piece he's ever passed is to rename the Bakersfield Post Office after favorite son, Merle Haggard. That's it. 
the Bakersfield Sound, for those of you that are musicians, okay? Or that you know that that country music, right? That's the only piece of legislation he's ever passed. He's gonna have a hard time getting to 222, or getting to 218 votes. This is why Nancy Pelosi, the former speaker, doesn't leave. This is why uh, Hakeem Jeffries doesn't leave. They'll all be there in the background because they have at least 213 and maybe as many as 216 votes. Given that dynamic, what do you think is gonna to happen to the bonkers of American politics over the last couple of weeks? What do you think the next six months are gonna be like? Way more bonkers, way more bonkers. And there's some key dates to pay attention to. This makes December 6th, the Georgia runoff, hugely important because Democrats need 52 votes in the Senate. They don't need 51, which they currently have. They need 52 because there's two senators, Kristen Sinema of Arizona, you may have heard of her, and Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who can upset the apple cart. And then you need to bring in the vice president to break that tie. So there's a problem there. So that makes the Georgia runoff hugely influential. And statistically, in looking at things, it looks like uh, sec uh, Senator Warnock is advantaged by about five points. But who's he running against? Remember the football star? Herschel Walker, right? Who makes Tommy Tuberville of Alabama seem like a rocket scientist. His candidate quality is quite low. As a result of this, on December 7th, on December 7th, the House takes up the lame duck session. And guess what happens to the United States government on December 7th at midnight? We run out of money. That's the continuing resolution. It happens the day after the Georgia runoff. Not by accident. By design from the CR, from the continuing resolution in September. That pushes us all the way forward to January 3rd when the new Congress is seated. And there's a curious thing in American political history. In 1930, in 1930, 16 members of Congress, 16 members of Congress who were elected on election day were not with us by the time of swearing in because they died because of a pandemic, because of a flu. In 1916, 14 members who were elected died before they were sworn in. If you have 222 members, or you have 218 members, and you need every single vote, what can you not afford? Somebody to get sick. You can't afford a single loss at all levels. Democrats know this, so what they will do is they will not help the Republicans, which pushes everything out to about March. You can call a vote for the House Speaker, for a new Speaker, whether it's Pam, Anya, Everhard, at any moment on the House floor for 218 votes at any time. So what do you think is going to happen over the next six months? Chaos is going to reign. It's going to flip back and forth. And Kevin McCarthy doesn't know what the hell will be going on because he's worried. He has a Freedom Caucus. He has a Liberty Caucus. He has a Liberty and Freedom Caucus. And I forget the name of the fourth caucus. There are four Make America Great Again caucuses. This is not that the Republicans are in disarray. It's that the Republicans are hugely split about what they're doing. Now, when we look at this fundamentally, what do we see going on? Remember, we have those Obama, Obama, Trump, Trump voters. That's what we call them, O-O-T-T. -T. Obama, Obama 8, Obama 12, Trump 16, Trump 20. And guess where they live? In Miami-Dade County, they're Latinos and Latinas. And what religion are those Latinos and Latinas? Catholic. Catholic. What do Catholics think about abortion? I don't like it. I don't like it. But the thing is, is they're not going to church. 41% of previously church-going Latinos are no longer going to the Catholic church. They're driving by a church. They're seeing a church. They're looking at a church on Christmas. Maybe on Easter they stop by, but they stopped going to the Catholic church. But they are hugely socially conservative, suspicious of government, worried about the border and immigration, and they are pro-life in huge, huge ways, oriented to family. Where should they be? What political party should they be part of? The Republicans. But why are they not? Because they think the party's racist. What about those double income, no kids, Google zillionaires working on the semiconductor industry or related to that, right? They live with someone of the same gender, or the same birth identity, I'm not sure how we're supposed to rephrase it, all right? They make a lot of money, they don't have kids in school, and they don't want to pay taxes. 
We'll call them libertarians. Why are they not part of the Republican Party? Because I think the party is homophobic. And Republicans understand this, and they understand this deeply. And what's happened to the power of labor in the United States over the last 70 or 80 years? A core Democratic Party constituency. It's died. The only uh, labor contingents that are really strong and left are the ones for professors, for public employees. We're it. And we're like 8%. Nobody cares about us. All right? The point here is both the Democratic and Republican parties are changing in dramatic ways. And remember that rising American electorate. They want good roads. They want good schools. They don't want to pay for them. That gives them a headache and they want to smoke a little dope. Okay? And that Jekyll and Hyde voter voted at plus two points for the Democrats this past election. Plus two points. And that means that the Democrats had the best showing that they've ever had of any in-party since 1934. And this is remarkable because they're supposed to lose. Democrats had a lot of money, and when they have a lot of money in advertising, guess what they do with it? They spend it horribly, all right? But Republicans did not start spending money until very late in New Hampshire, in Arizona, in Iowa, in Ohio, in Wisconsin, but not in Florida, because Florida is a, a, a red state. But in four or five states, they didn't start spending until three weeks before the election. And who spent? Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell. What about the main dude? That would be Donald Trump. He spent 12% of the money he received on candidates running for office. 12%. Normally, he spends 10%. So he was up 20%. Okay? He spent 12%. This is documented. I can show it to you. I can send you all the slides, whatever you like. He spent 12%. The money that he's raised, he has $94 million in the bank for his PAC. He cannot use that to run for president of the United States. He cannot use that to run for president of the United States. If you read that, if you hear that, it is completely false. It is against U.S. federal election campaign law to do that. He cannot take this $94 million and put it over to his presidential campaign fund. It's illegal. But where can he put it? To his legal defense fund. He can transfer it to other candidates. And some of those candidates did win. Carrie Lake did not win in Arizona for governor, right? The crazy guy with the cowboy hat who wanted to be Secretary of State and run the election in Arizona did not win. But down ballot, 62% of election deniers won. 62.2% of them won. That's a big number. But they were running for like dog catcher, you know, uh, <laughs> local police thing. They were running at very low levels and very safe seats. So they were successful down ballot in things that were kind of subterranean. But then your question is going to be, well, shouldn't Donald Trump be the presumptive nominee for 2024? And the answer is yes, because he can get 30% of the Republican Party vote, 30%. And Rick DeSantis cannot get that. Rick DeSantis can't get that. But the parties are changing in deeply dramatic ways. And what we saw was that the red wave became this red trickle because Democrats targeted races based upon five issues. They did talk about Dobbs and abortion. John Fetterman in Pennsylvania won the female vote by plus 15 points. Women voted for him because Dr. Oz, who won the male vote by 13 points, lives in New Jersey. All right. We looked at abortion for 25 to 35 year olds. Remember that Ray, that rising American electorate and younger women voted in huge ways by plus 10 points for Democratic candidates because they were worried about the future of their bodies and what was going on. And this played an important role in places like Nevada and in Arizona and in minor races down ballot in New Hampshire. And only one governor lost office, Governor Sisolik, the governor of Nevada. All other governors did well, and Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan led the Democratic ticket, and Democrats turned their lower house, their upper house, and won the governorship in Michigan. So watch her for 2024. That's a big, big deal, because she overperformed. So as we run through things, and let me add just a couple more components, more women ran for office at this particular election than ever before. And guess what? They won. But not all of them are liberal. Some of them are called Marjorie Taylor Greene from, from Georgia, right? More veterans ran than we've seen since 2012. But 149 of 195 of them lost. 
because these are not normal veterans. They were election deniers, which is very interesting and provocative for the future of American politics. In addition, in California alone, 178 lesbian, gay, transgender, QI individuals ran for office, and 165 of them won. So the diversity of American politics is way up. And if you're on the Republican side and you see this diversity, you can either push back against it, which is part of the Trump model, or you can embrace the Google zillionaires, and you can embrace Latinos and Latinas by relaxing the border, and you can build a coalition that's hugely helpful for 2024. Some of you may have heard of David Frum. David Frum was the famous speechwriter for Bush the Younger. In 2001, he coined the term axis of evil. You've probably heard that term. And David Frum made an observation in his 2006 and again in his 2008 book that you may not care about conservatism for the future of America, and you may not care about Republicans for the future of America, but Republicans and conservatives are different. Conservatives will reject democracy every moment. They will never reject conservatism. And that's exactly what is going on in American politics today as we move forward from 2022 to 2024, arguably the most consequential election for the future of Europe, for the future of the United States, for what's going on. And I know we say that about every damn election. Yeah. But this particular election, because of these demographic changes, because of the party changes, because of who Trump is, this next uh, 100, whatever number of days it is, I have a calendar on my phone, this next little bit for what is happening in the next 370 odd days is the most consequential election in the modern period, at least the most consequential since probably 1968. Thank you all very much. fascinating speech. No one touched the salads. Um, but I would invite you to please get started on the salads because they're waiting with the turkey even though this was really exciting. Um, so guten appetit. Please get started. Um, it was wonderful to listen to you. Thank you. I'm um, inviting your questions. David. Yes. Hi. Hi. So I have a question. Uh, how do you think gerrymandering uh, influences your analysis? I mean, because you you emphasize the difference between city and country. Yeah. But um, in Texas, uh, voting districts look like octopuses. So yeah. uh, there is no city and country. It's. I'm, I'm going to quibble with I'm going to quibble with this a little bit, but I appreciate the professor's question. Um, as a political scientist, we think rules matter or institutions matter. So we think gerrymandering mattered a lot. In, in Georgia, it doesn't seem to have suppressed turnout amongst African Americans. But in New York, it seems to have cost Democrats, because of what happened upstate, the legislature. So it, it backfired there. In Florida, the gerrymandering that goes on, which is notorious, was subject to the rules of what happened under the hurricane. After the hurricane, they relaxed all their voting access rules, and lo and behold, guess what? Republicans voted, which was not what they were expecting. Then you move to Texas, and as you know, eastern Texas is pretty damn red. It's not like Republican. They think Trump's a New Yorker. They think he's not, not real. <laughs> They're really deeply knuckle draggers, or what we call cavemen. And the districts out there don't run like those octopuses. Where they do run are in places like, you know, Austin, Pflugerville, uh, where the brown people live. <clears throat> and we see this in state after state. But it does lend itself. There's some other conditions, like in Texas, you can get the party ballot. It's one of 17 states where you can just ask for the Republican ballot. And you can just check all the boxes. You don't have to exercise any. Those 17 states happen to be all Trump states, by the way. So while gerrymandering has these differing effects, it's not a place that's going to put Texas purple anytime soon because of the conditions of what we see in old country over in the west side and old country over in the east side. So Texas is still going to be confined because of where those Democrats live, that great soil. Good question. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your, I think, very thoughtful uh, analysis. Um, just looking from the outside, I'm a German, I'm a dead forest guy, so 
quite a distance uh, to a uh, huge uh, country. Would you say it would be appropriate or would it more into a focus? Would it be a good goal for Joe Biden to run for presidency? Okay. In terms of what you have uh, said for the different groups. groups. Yeah. And especially for the group you have mentioned. The Ray, the Rising American Electorate. Yeah. So the Ray, um, so the Ray is more liberal than not, um, more female than not. Uh, there are more women in college in the United States than ever in our history, right? And they're entering the workforce, and they're not going to be paid 78 cents on the dollar. They're not going to be in the kitchen preparing Thanksgiving. They're going to be watching a damn football game or, or drinking a beer, whatever it is. This electorate is also not completing college. I mean, they're in college, but they don't finish. Pandemic, other reasons, huge student loans. They're more likely to have a relative living with them or a, a sick friend. So they're not taking care of their teeth or their car or their health care. They're like really one paycheck away. And so health care is a big deal for them. Family related matters are a big deal for them. And the environment is usually a top three issue for them, paradoxically. That's about the 25 to 35 group, 25 to 40. And then as we kind of move out from there, the environment is an issue moves down. And you get to my age, I'm almost 55, and the environment is like in the top 50 because I'm not going to be alive, right? So it's out there. But their issues are different. In that particular subset, in that group, they're more likely to be democratic leaners. Uh, the argument in the article I most recently read is they're not going to marry the Democrats. They're just going to walk with the Democrats to the wedding the wedding being the election. And that's what we're seeing because their party allegiance is, is not deep. So that means Democrats have to think about who their candidates are. And Joe Biden doesn't sell that sizzle because he's Grandpa Joe. Donald Trump doesn't sell that sizzle because he's Donald Trump, right? So that means each party has to look for what comes next. Is that the Vice President of the United States? It's not. And it's not the Vice President of the United States because she can't get through a contested primary. So let's posit, I think this happened the other night, let's posit that Joe Biden passes away. He dies. And the Vice President becomes the President and she runs, she will face Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Mayor Pete, maybe the Mayor or the Governor of our fair state, Governor Newsom, who has more skeletons in his closet than Halloween, and maybe one or two others. So Democrats are in a real pickle. And Joe Biden will run if Donald Trump runs, period. If Donald Trump is not in, it doesn't mean, it means that Joe Biden may not be in. So then the question is, who do Democrats look for? And I would argue a non-politician or Gretchen Whitmer. If not Whitmer, and that's going to be your traditional politician, I go off the grid. And, and my candidate, as you know, is Grant Hill. Yeah. Who's worth $249 million. He's a part owner of the Atlanta Hawks. He's a Rhodes Scholar. He's in the NBA Hall of Fame. His father's in the NFL Hall of Fame. He's always wanted to be Grant Hill. He's always wanted to be in public office. The point is they need to look off the grid. He went to Duke, and I hate Duke because I'm a Kentucky fan. All right? But he's the type of person, because you could get LeBron James, Stephen, you could get Curry, who can get Dream up. They could all talk about the rate needing necessity to vote. But Democrats won't do that because it's too smart. And they won't get George Clooney because he loves Italy too much. <laughs> so they're in a bit of a pickle. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you think about primaries? Um, we talked about these Ray voters. Do yeah. they have any influence in the primaries? Because you know, all the Trump candidates who won in the primary, they lost in the, well, most of them lost in the, in the main in the yeah. general election. So. <coughs> Thank you. That's a fantastic. I would never get that question on the stage. That's beautiful. Thanks, man. No. He's that's a political a, scientist. That's a beautiful question. Yeah, there's a couple things. So, so remember that. Remember, I said the Democrats spend stupidly. They don't make the good decisions. They have too much money. They spent 478 million dollars on those Trump deniers in the primaries. Super smart, right? And, and usually they're not. So that was a, an important element getting the radicals or the extremists on the ballot to face in that general election. And that seemed to be hugely powerful. But the Ray, the rising American electorate, these kind of purple people, weak-kneed liars, are not showing up. 
in primaries at all. And in California, we have differences in the party. In California, if you're not registered as a Republican, you cannot vote in the primary. These Ray voters in the Democratic Party can request a ballot and vote in the primary. But each party treats it differently. And this is common across the United States. And in some counties, it's even functionally different because uh, the person who's running the election in Kentucky, the county clerk, doesn't want to give you a ballot if you're a blue person or if you're a dark blue person, if you follow it. And this is the same thing in Ohio, the most northern southern state, to kind of follow the drift. So what you're talking about is not just at the state level, like redistricting and the gerrymander, but really at the county level, what's going on. And I would say to you as a fellow political scientist, that means you have to look at these elections, not even state by state, but county by county. There are 99 counties in Iowa, but only about five of them matter to the outcome. So we pay attention to what is going on in those five counties, and our models can make a very solid prediction. There are 11 districts or 11 counties in our mathematical model we pay attention to that is about 98 to 99% accurate in predicting the results for what will happen. Just that small number of counties, like parts of Bucks County, Pennsylvania. So that's what you have to look at because that's where the ray is functioning. But they're not participating in high levels based upon the rules of most states in the primary system. So Democrats are trying to push that by, for example, spending half a billion dollars. The other thing I did not mention is that uh, Pam and I are from California and we talk about uh, presidential elections and what's going on, but you, have heard, you might have heard of ballot measure politics that go on, uh, right? The Swiss have direct democracy. I'm a big expert on direct democracy. In California, ballot measure elections, direct democracy is the second most expensive elections in the world. In the world. Only the US presidential election is more money. In 2020, we spent $755 million on 12 measures, five of them passed. That's three quarters of a billion dollars. This past election, $900 million on seven. Three of them passed. The next election in 2024, there'll be 12 on the ballot and it'll be the first $1 billion ballot measure election in the history of the world. Two thirds of them fail and one third pass. So the smartest money in politics is on the no side of a ballot measure question. Because mathematically, you're hugely advantaged to do this. So that's where you're going to see, I think, a lot of the action that drives out the ray or can be can push down gerrymanders and what happens because it's the place that delivers the ray to politics around issues more than anything else. Yes? To which extent will geopolitical developments like Russia, China, the country influence the next elections in the US? Yeah, so uh, the last slide I would normally have is like, here, here are the issues, right? Critical race theory, gender identity, culture war politics, all that, that, that pocketbook, inflation, all of those kinds of things. I put like five issues up there and say none of these are issues in 2024. Because there's always something, and this is not in our model, that supplants this. A Ukraine invasion. A guy who fires off a bunch of nuclear weapons over Japan damn near, I mean, daily, weekly. Some type of uh, a mass shooting in a club in Virginia or Colorado. None of that is in our model, and, and it's really hard for us to forecast that and to see the effect of that. Because what we are seeing is a change. It's not that our response to foreign events is affecting the American body politic. It's that voters are pushing back against what that response looks like. They're becoming much more, the battle is becoming much more inwardly focused. And so the issues that happen abroad are, uh, they're not seen as detrimental to, the, to individual voter interests. They're not seen as negative, which is a real problem because we don't see why NATO matters. We don't see why events in Turkey or Iran or what happens in the Persian Gulf, why all that matters for the future of the American economy. The voters have, have really struggled with this. And, and the way that this is more recently developed is we're pushing back against politicians and their <coughs> revolting responses. There's a resistance there that's going on by most voter subsets, not all, not liberal Democrats and college professors, but other voter subsets. And, and I think that's a real danger for us. So it has the potential. Right? That's, that's a good question. Thank you.
Uh, all right, you want to know who the Republican nominee will be? <laughs> sure. Yes. 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 Uh, 30 percent. Uh, he can get 30 percent of the po of the pol he can get the plurality of what happens in a Republican primary if it's early. Trump can get that. He can get 30 percent. DeSantis will be the guy for the moment, but he won't be the guy at the end because he has not been vetted nationally. He has not faced the gauntlet that is the media because the media wants to write the story of his rise. And what's the next story they want to write? His fall and the, the phoenix rising from the ashes. That's the Donald Trump story. That's the story they want to write. That's hugely important, which means someone else can run through that muck. And if he could anoint that person, they'd be the chosen one. That's why you pay attention to Carrie Lake from Arizona. Also a loser, by the way. <laughs> yes? One more question. Do you see any chance for a third three-party system in the U.S.? Yeah. Great question. Uh, so after Trump leaves office on January 20th, 2021, when he's literally uh, flying to Andrews Air Force Base on uh, the chopper, he calls Rona McDaniel, the head of the uh, RNC, and he tells her that he's going to start his own party. That he's tired of this and the Republicans sold him out. This is documented, CBS, NBC, Vice. He spends the next month explaining how he's going to start another party. And I think that's what you have to pay attention to is in the back of his mind. And he knows that would sink the modern day Republican Party. And he doesn't give a hoot about that. So the third party wave that happens, I think, is a possibility on the Republican side, but you cannot forget BS. That's Bernie Sanders. You cannot forget him. Because the Democrats are facing this difficulty as well, because Joe Biden and Secretary Clinton are uh, conservative, mainstream, Chamber of Commerce Democrats. They're not new wave, Ray, rising American electorate Democrats. And that's gonna fracture that part. So the answer to your question is, uh, we're, if that fissure happens, we're talking third, fourth parties, both parties kind of at different times. This happened in 68 with Democrats, happened in 72 with Republicans, after both conventions and went awry in those cities. Of course, that gave us Richard Nixon. But. <coughs> Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. This was super informative and very entertaining and I love a speaker who dares to make a prediction as well um, and I don't want to monopolize you so we we are one big table so after the turkey we can switch it around as well and swap seats a little bit and um, happy Thanksgiving everyone and